I've spoken in the past several times of thinking of a human being as composed of body, emotion, mind, or thought, and consciousness. And I want to begin with a bit of a meditative exercise tonight based on that idea. So I'm going to close my eyes. And if I become aware of my body, I feel my feet on the floor and the seat, and I'm resting my arms on the desk. My emotions, I'm slightly nervous as I am when I do these videos, but imagine I'm sitting in a quiet room and feeling at peace. My mind, naturally, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, but again, imagine I'm sitting in a quiet room and my mind is more or less quiet and at peace. So we have consciousness and I want you to think of an analogy where consciousness is like a light lighting up a room and the walls and floor and ceiling of that room are like our body and the furnishings of the room, the pictures, the chairs are like our emotions and our thoughts. And so consciousness is shining and illuminating body, emotions, and thoughts. In a sense, body, emotions, and thoughts are an object and consciousness is the subject viewing them. So in a sense, perhaps, consciousness is our inmost, most intimate self. Certainly, it has the best claim to be our self in the sense that it's unchanging, that the consciousness I have now, if we think of it as a light illuminating a room, is the consciousness I had when I was two years old, lying in a crib. Whereas my body, my emotions, and my thoughts have all changed and continue to change. In two books we've mentioned in the past, The Spiritual Guide of Michael Molinos and The Cloud of Unknowing, they recommend this kind of going within, this kind of exercise. And this kind of exercise is appropriate if God is sort of as imminent and impersonal. We've spoken before about the idea of thinking as God as transcendent, transcendental and personal, which is the usual idea. God, our Father, who art in heaven. Father is a person and Father is in heaven. But when we have the idea of an imminent God who is within creation and within us, then it makes sense to get in touch with that God, to try to go within and to try to become still so that we can sense the presence. Now, if we think of this meditative exercise as allowing consciousness to become more conscious of itself, then that's a self-reflexive type thing consciousness conscious of itself. And just as a vague analogy, when you have feedback, when you have sound coming out of the speakers being amplified, it eventually tries to go to infinity and can't and you get that squeal of feedback. But there are various philosophical reasons for thinking that self referential processes go to infinity. And if we identify consciousness as we do, in our monist philosophy as being part of somehow akin to the uncreated light, the ultimate ground of existence, which we consider God, then this is obviously a religious activity. We are trying to get close, closer to that spark of God that is within us. Uh, I attend a Quaker meeting close to me and for Sunday service, we sit in silence in a bare room. 
this might seem strange to people who have a transcendental personal God. But if God is imminent, then if God is within, then there's no need of stained glass windows and golden chalices. And also, if God is within each of us, then in a sense, we're all potential ministers. Quakers, at least of the traditional type, the meeting that I go to, have no official minister. We have uh, people who perform duties and we have elder people that we respect as perhaps having more knowledge than us, but nothing official. We're all potential ministers. And when we sit in silence, the idea is ideally to get in touch with God. And when someone feels led at a Quaker meeting, they stand up and speak, usually briefly. Some meetings, no one feels led and no one speaks. We sit in silence for 55 or 60 minutes and then the meeting ends. If we make this sitting in stillness and becoming more conscious of our own consciousness, or if we prefer becoming closer to God, then a lot of values follow. Not necessarily morality, but values. In other words, if I want my emotions to be quiet, then maybe I'll value forgiveness. Maybe I'll value being honest and dealing with people fairly so that when I sit, I don't feel guilt and I don't feel anger. Sitting in silence, perhaps uh, instead of quieting my mind, perhaps I would read a scripture to try to get myself in the mood. Uh, there are also uh, in the East, there's something called a mantra where you repeat a phrase mentally. In Christianity, in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, there's the Jesus prayer. Some people in Eastern Orthodoxy repeat, Lord Jesus uh, Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And they repeat that over and over again. The idea of these practices, as I understand it, is to still and focus the mind so that it can become quiet. As an aside, I teach math at a community college. And I sometimes tell my students that they're two or three minutes away from being a good student. Because I think, I'm not sure, that because of media, because a TV commercial or a TV show can have five scenes in two seconds, perhaps people, some students aren't accustomed to focusing and staying with something. Because literally sometimes understanding something is a matter of looking at it for two or three minutes and letting it sink in. And I believe that some students can't do that or don't do that. They give it five seconds and well, it doesn't take them that long to understand something on TV and therefore they believe they can't master the subject. That's an aside, that's a detour. Getting back to the subject at hand, the idea of consciousness being our soul, if you will, our true self, the spark of God within us. And that body, emotion, and intellect are in some sense once removed from what we really are, has often had an unfortunate history in that it's been taken negatively. People have seen the body as a prison. People have seen the world as maya, maya, as illusion. And they've, some people have hated the body. They've seen the world as a terrible place, as a prison for the soul. I believe the old Gnostics, some of them had that view. And I think some of them would have figuratively kicked the world in, into the trash can if they could have. And as an antidote to that view, I believe that view is, is a little warped. There's a story called Siddhartha, which I read many years ago. It was very popular in uh, when I was at teenager, young 20s. And there's a scene in there where Siddhartha's friend is speaking to him and his friend is a, is a Buddhist monk. And he says, is the world real? Isn't it an illusion? Isn't it uh, Maya? And Siddhartha says, well, if illusions are not, they are what I am. And so I love them. And he says that some of the 
great thinkers may despise the world, but he's only interested in loving the world. And the idea is that if we see the world also as a manifestation as the ultimate ground of existence, then it's all here. And what's stopping us perhaps from experiencing ourselves or the world as uncreated light is, is our own makeup that uh, we have to work on. So it's not the world that's stopping us, it's ourselves. So I also want to tie what I've said into something I've said previously. I've mentioned before the positive way and the negative way. Where negative doesn't mean bad. The idea is, is the positive way is when people try to approach God by affirming the world. And such people often lead lives of service, helping other people. The negative way is when a person tries to withdraw, tries to quiet their mind, emotions, intellect, and, and reduce their involvement with the world so that they can be free to meditate. And uh, this is the idea of the monk or the nun or the yogi that goes off into a cave to meditate. But to sum up, I think that the idea of consciousness withdrawing into itself to either become aware of itself or if you prefer to become aware of the soul or to become aware of God is a fair description of what meditation and contemplation are. Now I use those two words because in the West, contemplation has, as I understand it, the meaning that meditation has in the East. In the West, meditation is often taken to mean like uh, thinking about an incident in the life of Jesus and imagining how you would have felt when you were there. But the idea of consciousness trying to go within and become directly aware of God is, I believe, called contemplation in the West and meditation in the East. And I also believe that many religious values and activities are designed to support this kind of contemplation slash meditation. Well, thank you for listening.